morning, everyone. Uh, today begins our last topic with respect to your creature features. And um, both lectures that you guys are going to view today have to do with things that are presenting challenges to your creatures and putting them potentially putting them at risk. So the first thing we're going to be talking about today um, is our um, fisheries. Um, our commercial fishing, it makes up a good bit of our fisheries um, responsibilities. Um, they do have other responsibilities as well, but managing the commercial fishing industry is kind of the largest part of their job. Um, our marine fisheries are usually along the continental shelf and they also um, encompass about 20% or 20 percent of our fisheries occur in upwelling areas um, and so if you think about that our upwelling areas are a very small part of the ocean they make up about 0.1 percent of the total ocean and so we have a lot of our fishery um, volume that's coming from a very small amount of our ocean. So we fish from what's called standing stock and that is um, basically what's available in an ecosystem at any given time um, and one of the really difficult things to balance and figure out where the line is that you don't want to cross um, is to avoid overfishing. So if we're harvesting fish too quickly or if we're taking juveniles out of the ecosystem, we're preventing a normal race of reproduction. And so we want to make sure that um, that's not happening. And so fisheries management is partly responsible for making sure that that balance is happening where the species is still able to reproduce at a normal or above normal rate. Um, and so that the amount that we take out of the ecosystem doesn't prevent that. And so again, how much we harvest and then making sure that they're of a certain age um, are the two most um, important factors in, that, in finding that balance. So overall though, we are seeing a reduction in what's called the maximum sustainable yield. Um, and so we need to look at why some of those things are happening. And so we'll be addressing some of that throughout um, the lecture today. So just know for the moment that we have seen that reduction in that maximum sustainable yield and we're going to be kind of addressing some of those reasons why throughout. So we have 52% um, of our fisheries that are fully exploited and what that means is that it's not safe to um, catch them anymore. If we increase the amount that we're catching, sorry, it is safe to catch them at a certain level, but if we increase our catch, we cannot um, maintain or sustain that species anymore. And so 52% are fully exploited, 18% are overexploited, 9% are depleted. And so typically you're overexploited and you're depleted um, fisheries, those typically close for a time. But what we're seeing is that, so here we have about 27% of our fisheries that are overexploited are depleted and only 1% of those are recovering. And so, and we only have 1% that are recovering. So not enough is being we're not seeing enough recovery to reopen a lot of the fisheries that we've closed um, due to overfishing now that we've understood that they're overfished. That only leaves about 20% of the available fisheries open for business. Um, so when we um, are continuing to consume the same levels of seafood and seafood related products um, on a, only 20% of stock, that starts to create a really big, not only supply and demand problem and um, prices obviously change according to that, but also we have a major sustainability issue because remember that, okay, yeah, this 20% is still good to go, but remember last week we were talking about food webs and chances are 
some of these overexploited um, or an overfished populations are part of the food webs for these guys that we're still able to fish. And so we have to think about what the whole picture is of that fishery health um, in order to understand how we best help it recover. So we have 80% then, so if 20% is still fishable, we have about 80% that are fully exploited, overexploited, depleted, or recovering. Um, so the problem with that is that part of that includes our large predatory fish. And so we um, have issues there because our large predatory fish are the ones that also happen to be really good to eat. Um, and so we have now these populations of smaller fish that are beginning to explode and be huge, um, see huge increases in reproduction. And so our fisheries are refocusing on those smaller fish. And so at first, again, we're thinking, okay, that's great, there's plenty of them. But the problem is, is that they are the base of the food web for those large or lower levels of their food web for those larger predatory fish. Well, then you have your food chain or your food web cut off and those larger predatory fish aren't able to come back, aren't able to recover. So it becomes very difficult to balance all of that because, okay, we can't fish our larger fish because they're too overfished. But then we also need to be careful, even though there's an abundance of them, fishing our smaller fish because we need to make sure that there's enough left in the ecosystem to help our large fish recover. So when we have these, this increased fish production, we're always going to see a decrease in stock. So what the thought has been over the last probably decade especially um, is just to maintain fisheries output instead of trying to increase every year. In many years, they're actually seeing decreases, which obviously has a human impact on the employability and the employment of fishermen as well. So here's our total production since 1950, and it peaked about 1988. And our fish production is still very, very high. And part of this steep increase had to do with technology availability. Um, it became a really well-known job um, and a promoted job that wasn't being done enough to supply food for the world. And so there was a lot of government help during this time between 1950 and 1980 that, um, helped incentivize people to go into the fishing business. And so there's this huge increase in the fishing fleet worldwide. And the problem is, is that in 1988, we had our peak. And that's when we also started understanding some of the effects of what we were doing. Now, since then, we've decreased our global catch by about 18%. Um, and that has been achieved largely by North America and some island nations who are trying to do a really good job with fisheries management. But notice that that's still a pretty high catch. Most countries in the world, and we'll look at this, but most countries in the world are still like, well, the fish are still there, so we're going to still fish them and we need to feed our people. So, yeah, we're still going to. And it's been very difficult to come to a consensus worldwide about what should happen. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit and start talking about some of the downsides of fishing, uh, commercial fishing. Um, and so one of those is incidental catch or bycatch. And this may be something, your creature, some of you chose pretty obscure things, um, which is fine and often encouraged. But um, your creature is potentially not fished commercially, but could still very much be impacted by commercial fishing in the way of incidental catch or bycatch. So we have these non-commercial species you can see in here. We've got skates, we've got um, different turtles, we have looks like a couple of rays of some sort, um, and they are caught by accident basically. And unfortunately, your bycatch can sometimes end up being 
way more than what you actually intended to catch because of where your creatures um, or where the fishes that are being fished um, tend to hide out and hang out. Um, birds, turtles, dolphins, and sharks are really high on the awareness list for this because one of their reasons for drastic decrease in numbers coincides right with this massive boom for fishing, um, for commercial fishing, and how they were being caught. Um, tuna and dolphins swim together because dolphins eat tuna. And there are things called purse seine nets, which we'll talk about in a minute. And they were used originally to um, catch tuna. Well, if dolphin and tuna swim together, then dolphin are also caught. Um, so this prompted the Marine Mammals Protection Act. And there was a specific addendum for dolphins. And one of the things that this enabled was the banning of drift nets, um, also known as gill nets, which were banned in 1989. Again, though, you would have to have every single country in the world ban this um, for it to be effective, and it's just been banned locally. So, here's some different ways that we commercially fish. These over here on the left, this is your gill net or your drift net. These are the ones that have been banned in North America. We have your trawl net. So, this is basically a big net that's, tra or that's traveling behind or drug behind a boat. You have your crustacean and benthic creature pots, so like your crab pots and lobster pot. These are long lines, so they come out behind a boat and each line can catch one fish. And then you have your purse seine nets. And these are a big hot topic because of the same reason that the gill nets and the drift nets were. Nothing can get out of here once they're enclosed, so it becomes a really large problem. With today's technology, we also have um, observation using satellite and spotter planes, and this helps um, fishermen know where the um, schools of fish are. And then we also farm fish now. So we have aquaculture pens that are out in um, native waters that are raising stock. So this is kind of all of the responsibilities of the fishery management. They regulate, they handle conflicting interests, interests but they also have several conflicting interests. Um, they're responsible for human employment, so that's a huge um, problem sometimes when you're having to lay people off. But they're also charged with creating self-sustaining marine ecosystems. And sometimes those two things, human employment and self-sustaining marine ecosystems, do not go together. Um, they are responsible for international waters, and so that makes enforcement really difficult because if another country doesn't cooperate, then so be it. It's not useful it's not effective so we have many large fishing vessels most of them not most of them um, there was a, again earlier we said that there was a lot of government subsidizing um, so in 1995 the world fishing fleet spent 124 billion dollars but there was only 70 billion dollars worth of fish to catch so there's a lot of money being spent um, on decreasing stock and so at some point that becomes not worth it anymore so our fishing fleet has drastically decreased since then our northwest atlantic fisheries we've talked about the grand banks and georgia's bank um, we do a decent job in canada and the united states of restricting and enforcing bans um, and we have some fish stocks that are rebounding um, unfortunately some other fish stocks such as cod which is highly sought after for bait and to eat um, are still declining. And so that becomes a really, really large problem. Here's the general effectiveness worldwide of fisheries. All of that red means that their fisheries enforcement is not effective. Green would mean it is effective. We don't really have anyone truly in the green, but we have some of these island nations here that do a pretty good job. And then we're in the yellow orange area up here. Our deep water fisheries are seeing um, issues as well um, because when our, excuse me, our deep water fisheries is where people are getting pushed out to, um, but our bottom trawling nets are doing lasting damage to those deep sea um, ecosystems. And this is a part of where that cod depletion has um, caused a problem because we're replacing with deep water green, Greenland halibut, but then we're doing all the damage with the nets. One of the biggest things that you can do is in your seafood choices. 
So we have all this here that talk about choices that you can make in your seafood. You should look at that. Climate change, we're gonna talk about in the next lecture. So I'm gonna go ahead and 